Well, hey there, and welcome back to uh, the studies at Joe's Kitchen Table. Uh, I'm off of vacation again, and so I'm uh, going to get back to studying the Word of God with you. Uh, and so what I decided to do was to jump into 1 John. 1 uh, John is a great uh, book of the Bible, a great New Testament book, of course, uh, and a great book to uh, remind us. Uh, as John, you, you know John does, because if you've ever looked at his gospel, and in fact, if you're following Pastor Ben's study right now, you know that John is the love disciple. He talks a lot about love. And that comes through in 1 John, to be sure, but also 2 and 3 John as well. But all right, uh, we're going to jump into 1 John uh, chapter 1. We'll probably do the whole chapter because it's very short. But, uh, well, as you know with me, we'll just see what happens, right? <laughs> so why don't I pray? And again, I'm going to pray for our time together, but also pray against the situations that are impinging us as a as a nation, as a, well, as a state, as a nation, and, and of course, as our world too. So let's do that. God, we love you and we thank you for this time together. You are so good that you draw us together around your word, Lord, that you have given us your pure and perfect word, everything you want us to know about you, certainly not everything about you, but everything you want us to know about you. And so, God, we pray as we study your word now that you would strengthen us, that you'd help us to live for you. Uh, that we wouldn't just hear words, but that we would, in fact, act on them. Uh, but we also pray, God, that you would uh, bring a, an end to this coronavirus and that you would also, God, uh, bring peace in our land and um, healing in our land as well and help us to value every human being as someone that you not only loved and created, but also redeemed by the blood of your son, Jesus. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. All right, cool. Uh, so why don't we just read the first four verses, and then uh, I'll make some commentaries, as you you know I've I've been known to do, right? Well, that's what you pay me to do. That's kind of a handy handy gig there. All right. So, First uh, John chapter one, it says this: that which from the beginning, well, excuse me, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the word of life just means Jesus, all right? Uh, the gospel, but also particularly Jesus. I'll explain that in, in a second. The life was made manifest in Jesus, of course, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us, that which we have seen and heard and proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things to you that our joy, that's really important, I'll come back to that, that our joy, excuse me, may be complete. So what it, what is going on here? So you, if you've ever studied 1 John, you've probably heard the word Gnostics, all right? Uh, the uh, w reason that knowledge is spelled K-N-O-W, uh, knowledge, is, is because the word comes from gnosis in Greek, which is G-N-O-S-S-I-S, -S -S, uh, transliterated in English. And so uh, the Gnostics were those that were the knowing ones, is the best way to say it, how to, to know uh, the depths of philosophy, to know the depths of everything, all right? What they rejected was the physical side of life and only embrace the spiritual side. And that's, that's very simplistic, but I'm going to leave it at that for you because, frankly, it's not going to change your life a whole lot. But it does help you understand First John, all right? So what John is saying is, look, we not only saw Jesus, we not only heard Jesus, but we touched him too. He was physical and the Gnostics would reject that. The physical was bad. The spiritual is good. In fact, they would even reject the fact that God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, they would say he wouldn't stoop to such a thing, all right, which is ridiculous. And so it's important for us as Christians because we value the spiritual. Don't God, please. The spiritual is important. You are body, soul, and spirit. Uh, I, I shouldn't even use the, the trifecta there, but the, the Bible does in two different places, uh, uses the words body, soul, and spirit. <clears throat> but you are both physical and spiritual. And we know that because you continue on. We know that people do. And uh, uh, I know that's, <laughs> that, that sounds pretty bold to say because how do I know that they do? Well, it, it just is... Um, the best way to say it is this, as a guy that has seen probably 500 or more people die, I've, I've uh, 
experienced a lot of death in my ministry. I know that when a person dies, who they were is what ceases to be. So who they were, in my opinion, is their soul spirit. I, I don't care how you want to call it, all right? Their soul spirit, their, their uh, eternal uh, being, all right? And uh, who they were physically is laying on the table, all right, when they die. And so something leaves. There's no question about that. It's not just that the heart stops, not just that the brain ceases, but something actually leaves. And I would suggest to you that is their, their soul or their spirit. And as Christian people, we rejoice because at some point our physical bodies will be rejoined with our soul or our spirit. That's First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. Uh, and uh, I'll put that in the notes for you. But uh, uh, our, our soul or our spirit or soul spirit, whatever you want to say, uh, is reconnected with our body and we are eternal physically. Uh, and that's important. God intended us to be physical beings in his spiritual realm. And his spiritual realm is then also physical. Yeah, that doesn't mean you're going to play golf all eternity, which a lot, of, a lot of guys like me go, oh, praise be to God, eternal golf courses, and I never shoot worse than par, right? Uh, but uh, no, it's not that. It's just that it is, in fact, physical, like the Garden of Eden was, all right? And so that's the best way to look at it is that heaven is a restoration to the Garden of Eden. We have a perfect relationship with one another, and we have a perfect relationship with God. All right, so cool. So that's what John is writing against. And so he's saying, look, you can say that the, sp the spiritual is good and the physical is bad, but we Christians say the physical and the spiritual are good. Why? Because Jesus is both physical and spiritual, all right? And so that's what he's saying in that first part, all right? So um, he, he gets at this idea of testifying and proclaiming uh, eternal life uh, and uh, I just want to point you to two passages. One is an obvious, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, which is the Great Commission. And remember that the Great Commission was spoken to the pastors, but it was spoken for all Christians. It was spoken to the pastors, but it was spoken for all Christians, all right? Uh, the pastors are not the only ones that carry forth the gospel into the world. There's this new thing in our synod where uh, pastors believe that, and it's not true, Every Christian has a responsibility to share the gospel with those that are around them, those that they encounter every day. That is your job as a Christian. Let, let me say it again. That is your job as a Christian. There's a reason 99% of my sermons end with, okay, now go tell someone else about how cool this is, that I, what I've just told you about Jesus, all right? Because that's your job. That's what you're here to do. You're not here to live and move and have your being in your physical life only. You're here also to bring the spiritual life that Jesus offers people, the forgiveness of sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit and life everlasting. That's what you're here to do, all right? And, and I, know, I know that it's um, easier for some than it is for others. For me, it's just a cakewalk. It's what I do. It's who I am, all right? And I know that doesn't always work for you, and that's okay. But pray to God that he would use you, and I'm going to say it this way because we're coming to this, that he would use you as a bright light in this world. Remember, Jesus said, you are the light of the world, even though Jesus said, I am the light of the world. John 8, 12 is, I am the light of the world. And then in Matthew 5, he says, you are the light of the world. Okay, <clears throat> so why does he say that? Because Jesus lives in you. Galatians 2, 20, how many times have we been here, Christian? It is no, I, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but what? It's, I'm not living for me. I, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Okay, so that's, that's our role. Hard, yes. Sometimes ragingly difficult, absolutely. Nonetheless, it's required and called for. Because you have been saved, God calls you to bring that saving grace to someone else. Think about this. You're dealing with all of this stuff in our world right now, and you have Jesus. I want you to imagine those that do not have Jesus and are dealing with all this stuff in our world. How scared they must be. They need Christ, and we have him. And so we can take him to them. It's not up to you to convert them. It is simply up to you to be faithful, to bring the gospel to them, okay? So that's what John is saying. They, they saw it, they heard it, they touched it, and we're going to testify to it now. 
That's the same thing for you. Now, you didn't see Jesus. You haven't touched him. You haven't heard him out loud. But you know him, don't you? You are the embodiment of what Jesus said to St. Thomas when he said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. That's you, you see. But, but you're blessed, right? But don't forget the principle. We're blessed to be a blessing, okay? All right, cool. You, you got it. I don't need to go further. Okay, so that which we have seen and heard, proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship. I just want to point out Romans 10, 17. I think I've done that for you before, but Romans 10, 17 says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ or the word of God, all right? So rem let me remind you, you are not to convince anybody. Now, you should be able to defend your faith. There's no question. But you don't have to convince anybody. You simply live your faith in Jesus Christ, speak the gospel, tell people what you trust, tell them that you believe that Jesus is, uh, ha or has lived and died and rose again for you, and that's, that's your faithfulness. That's all you need to do. You do not need to be a preacher. You simply need to be a person that is a proclaimer. A proclaimer of what? A proclaimer proclaimer of the, the word of Christ or the word of God, a proclaimer of the gospel message that Jesus Christ lived and died and rose again for them. All right, cool. Uh, and, and furthermore, now I'm going to read this second segment. Furthermore, proclaiming to them that everyone is a sinner and God loves sinners and forgives sinners. Okay. So let, let's just read five, five down to the end of the chapter, which is verse 10. This is the message that we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Pause for just a second. Uh, Luke 2 verses 8 and 9 are very important here. I, I, I do this uh, around Christmas time in sermons, uh, but the angels show up on the hills of Bethlehem to the shepherds. Remember Luke 2. And when they do, the Bible tells us the glory of the Lord shone around, uh, shone round about them is, is typically how we say it, all right? So what was going on there? Well, you could probably make the case that God's glory was shining on the hills of Bethlehem that day from God, all right? Absolutely. But I would suggest to you that this is similar to, to uh, Moses. When Moses' face shone after being in the presence of God, remember he even had to wear a veil because he didn't want the people to worship him. He wanted the people to worship God. And so, well, God didn't want him to do that either. Uh, but them to do that either. But uh, so he wore a veil. He covered up his face. <clears throat> now, what was going on in the hills of Bethlehem? In my opinion, the angels hang out with God day in and day out, and they carry with them the brilliant, just like Moses, they shine brightly with what? The glory of the Lord that shone round about the, the hills of Bethlehem and to those lowly shepherds out there on the fields uh, watching their flocks by night. So, uh, in, in the same way that Moses' face shone, the angelic beings shine with what? With the, the blazing light of the brilliant light of God, you see. And, and isn't that a wonderful truth, right? Uh, that we're going to be kind of like glow sticks in heaven, you know, that we are, in fact, shining with the brilliant light of the God who is light. And this is so important. When we talk about the metaphorical use of the word darkness, that we live in a dark world, a darkened, sin-darkened uh, uh, existence in this sin-darkened world, it's a reminder that right now you have the light of Christ. I said it just a moment ago. The light of Christ is living in your body. The light of Christ is part and parcel of who you are. The light of Christ is... Uh, uh, emanating from you on a daily basis, maybe, maybe not physically, but very, very real. Uh, don't, don't think that spiritual is surreal. It is real. A and it's emanating from you. People will see a difference in you as you live your life for Jesus Christ in this world. All right, so you can, you can bring the glory of the Lord to shine around them as well, just like the angels did that day. And oh, in fact, don't forget... The word angel means messenger, right? And that's what you are. Now, you're, I'm going to tell you right now, I know the people watching this video, you ain't no angel, right? But I will tell you this, you are a messenger, aren't you? And, and you know that that's true. You're a messenger for God. You're a messenger from God. Uh, you're bringing the gospel of Jesus to people. It's so desperate. Man, they so desperately, desperately need hope right now. And the hope of everlasting, never-ending life. All right, cool. Verse six. 
If we say we have fellowship with Jesus or God while we walk in darkness, in other words, we're the opposite of the light, uh, we lie and don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Isn't that interesting? And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We say we have no sin. Here you go. This is the, our, from our liturgy. Well, it's from the Bible in our liturgy. Uh, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. All right, so uh, a couple things here. Uh, it's very important for you to understand that um, you are a sinner. You need to be reminded of that on a regular basis, all right? Uh, and that's why we do, we call it the law gospel dialectic. That's why we constantly preach sinful world, love of God in Jesus Christ, sinful world, love of God in Jesus Christ, because that's the way the Bible acts. Uh, the Bible is a reminder that you are a sinful person. And in fact, in that short three verses reminds you a couple of times, but it also reminds you that you can confess your sins. Uh, so the first place I'd send you is John 20, 19 to 23. Please look that up. Uh, it's a reminder of what Jesus spoke to the apostles. Uh, it's a reminder of what Jesus spoke to the pastors. There's no question. But every Christian can do this. Every Christian can offer the forgiveness of sins to another Christian. If a Christian comes to you and says, you know what? I need your forgiveness. I have, I have sinned against God and I've sinned against you. I need to be forgiven. You can forgive them. And it's real. That forgiveness is real. You, you don't have to wait for a pastor. You don't have to go to church to do it. Uh, you don't have to go to his office to do it. You can do all those things, by the way. And they are, as we say in the liturgy, meet, right, and salutary, so to do, of course. Confession and absolution is wonderful. But understand that that can be done between two Christians, a husband and a wife, a brother and a sister, friend to friend, whatever it happens to be. If you confess your sins to someone, even if you haven't sinned against them, if you confess your sins to, to someone who is a Christian, a Christian has the right by the power of the Holy Spirit to speak forgiveness forgiveness to you. And maybe that's what you need. In fact, uh, I'm going to prove it to you by sending you James 5.16. James 5.16 says, confess your sins one to another. What? Right? Nah, I, I don't ever do that. I'm not going to. Why would I ever do that? Why would I ever let someone else know how sinful I really am because as Christians, we're real. As Christians, we're not putting on fake airs, whatever, you, you understand. We're not pretending to be something. We're just down to earth people that say, you know what, we blow it. I do this for you all the time. I am your senior pastor. I am your lead pastor. And yet I stand before you as a sinful human being in need of God's grace every day. And yes, my friends, in need of your proclamation of forgiveness to me too, okay? I am not somehow above you. I am your leader, your God-given leader, but I'm not above you. No one is above another in the church. Only Christ is the head of the church. That's it. And so, we stop and we say to one another, by the way, pastor to parishioner, parishioner to pastor, or parishioner to parishioner, you understand. We say that you can be forgiven. We announce forgiveness. You know why? Because forgiveness brings the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guarding our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, you see. That's what we need today. We need to be reminded that we are forgiven sinners, that that in fact, well, Luke 19, that Jesus came, verse 10, by the way, uh, Jesus came into the world to say, seek and to save that which was lost. He came to save you, Christian. He came physically, as John said it, and he came spiritually too. He came physically as the son of man. He came physically as one just like us, and that's important, by the way but he came spiritually as the son of God. He came spiritually as the Christ, Jesus, the Christ, in order that he might forgive your sins and empower us to then reach into each other's lives and, and to confess our sins one to another, but also to forgive sins as well. I hope this encourages you today and 
I hope it helps you a little bit with this first part of 1 John. I may have a few other verses for you later. I got some written in my notes, but I didn't look them up, so I am not going to give them to you unless I look them up, all right? So uh, let me just say it one more time. The peace of God, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, may it guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Amen.